Welcome to the library. My name is Troy Swanson. I'm the library department chair. Um, this is one of our uh, fall events related to the bicentennial of Illinois. So Illinois turns 200. The technical day is this coming December. There's going to be a party in the library. We're going to have cake and everything. Come and, come and join us December 3rd. Um, but over this fall, we're going to be doing a series of different events highlighting different uh, areas of Illinois history. And uh, Mary and I have had many conversations. We both have done some research into um, Bishop Hill, Illinois, which I'll tell you about, and um, the Mormons, and I think they're a great um, kind of hidden secret uh, histories of our state. So um, I'm going to tell you about the Bishop Hill Colony in a second. I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Most of you, I think pretty much all of you in here know me because you're in my class, so there, so there we go. We're good. Um, so um, as, uh, as Professor Swanson said, you guys know my name. I'm Mary Fuglis. Um, feel free to ask questions anytime. But I'm going to be talking to you guys about Mormons and the time, the brief time they spent in the city of Nauvoo, which is on the, the well, I'll show you where it is in just a second. So let's, uh, I, I had to come up with some kind of alliteration, so I had Mormons murdering mayhem, very dramatic. So in case you ever wonder where Nauvoo is, and I think I asked you guys this before, none of you have ever, have ever been there, right? No one's ever passed through there, have, have ever seen it before? It's a cute little town right on the banks of the Mississippi River, um, and I'll show you some pictures of, of what it looks like today. But the Mormons lived there from basically 1839 through 1846 when they then left the area, were expelled basically from the area, and ended up moving west um, to Utah, where they stayed ever since. And so most people don't realize that they actually spent some time here in Illinois. And while it was brief, it was memorable. So it, that, that is definitely the case. So, um, oh, do you see that? Sometimes the colors look one way on your computer, and then they look a different way on the screen. So Joseph Smith was a man who was born uh, in Vermont in 1805. This is a picture of him with an angel. I'll get to that shortly. And uh, he was a charismatic, tall, handsome. He, he was said to have had very piercing blue eyes, very mesmerizing. And you can imagine, since he founded a religion that still exists today in this country, uh, he was able to persuade people and to gather people around him. So if I were to ask you guys the question, what do you know about Mormons? What would you, anything that you would kind of throw out there, what do you know about them? What'd you say, multiple wives, yeah? Yes, sir. The gold plates, yeah. <laughs> but usually the first thing people always say is the multiple wives. And sometimes if they know, you know, Joseph and the amazing Technicolor gold plates, they will point that out too. Um, but but <laughs> so in the, 18, in the 1820s um, in, in New England, and I'm not sure if this existed outside of New England, but there was kind of this, this movement, if you will, or these people who were treasure seekers who believed that there were treasures planted in the earth and they were, they were digging around to try to find them. Um, Joseph Smith came from a, a rather poor family and he decided he was actually on the search for treasure himself, um, which kind of lends you a bit of insight into his character. And he states that in, in September of 1823, he had this vision, the first of many, many visions that he had. Um, an angel named Moroni came to him and basically told him that there were these gold plates that were buried in the earth that he had to unearth. And once he dug them up, there would be text that would be uh, basically revealed to him. And this text that would be, be the direct revelation from God and from there, essentially, he'd be founding a new faith. So he dug up the plates. Um, he, you know, they, they were revealed to him, and then they disappeared for a while, and they came back again, and they disappeared for a while, and a few other people supposedly saw them, but um, they just kept disappearing, and eventually were never seen from again. And basically, Joseph Smith became the sole carrier of information from that was coming directly from God. Now, if you're detecting some skepticism in my voice, you probably are, because I, I try every time I talk about this not to be skeptic, skeptical, but I know it does come out. Um, it's, and I think it's probably because, you know, when you think about it, this, was a, this is a distinctly American religion. So when you're talking about a guy digging up gold plates from the earth and God's word be, being revealed through him, um, it sounds a bit far-fetched, maybe, to some of us, in the 1820s, perhaps. But is it really that different from, let's say, talking about Moses and the Ten Commandments, right, or Noah and the Ark, you know? Parting the Red Sea for Moses does sound a little bit far-fetched. Um, and of course, I'm thinking of history of the world where I've got these 15, oops, <laughs> 10 commandments. Um, so, I mean, is it any different? And maybe because it's so recent, um, it, we tend to be a little bit more skeptical of it, and perhaps with time, our opinions might change on that. We could touch more on that later, if you'd like. Um, but a as time goes on, by 1830, um, Joseph Smith has written down enough of this, of this information to collect it in this book, and he call it's called the Book of Mormon. Now, what's interesting is about it is that he was a poor dude, didn't have a lot of money, but had to come up with money in order to be able to publish it. So he tells one of his neighbors, who was a, a wealthier man, who had a farm near, his, near him, and said, 
you got to sell your farm, and the proceeds from your farm you have to give to me, and I'm going to use that money to publish the Book of Mormon. And the guy's like, ah, I don't know if I should. The wife's like, absolutely not. Don't, don't you <laughs> dare do this. Um, but he does it anyway, and the wife ends up divorcing the guy. Um, and it's with that money that he ends up publishing the Book of Mormon. Now, Mark Twain call, famously called the Book of Mormon chloroform in print, which is kind of an interesting way of putting it, that it, something that kind of puts you to sleep or maybe kind of suffocates your mind. or yeah, <laughs> take, take, that, take from that what you will, but... Um, but so he so but from there he gathers his following and the amazing thing is how he gets more and more people to follow him So he might start off with 20 people then it goes to a hundred then the next by the next year He's got like 300 till basically by the time he's in Illinois. He's got 20,000 followers who are, are, are with him So after he leaves uh, it's, it's on, they're, they're on the road again a lot. So they leave New York and they end up in Kirtland, Ohio um, Everywhere they're going they tend to find themselves having some trouble with their neighbors in this case, Joseph Smith got himself involved in some kind of shady business investments and ended up having to de declare bankruptcy and had creditors on him, like, not too happy with him. And they were forced to flee Ohio, and, they, and then he told them that God willed it that they were supposed to now move to Independence, Missouri. They move out to Missouri, and basically, you know, they were, the Mormons were anti-slavery, and they were also doing some business with the Native Americans. So, you know, put the two together, right, you know, if they're anti-slavery and they're trying to you know, work with the Native Americans, that's not good. And so they find themselves getting not just expelled, but for like the only time in American history, there's an extermination order basically issued against them by the governor of Missouri, who basically says, kill them all. And the militia of about 3,000 Missourians heads out to, to kill them. And it's, it, the, the picture that you're seeing there is from 1838. And the, the, you know, the dates kind of overlap. I got the 27th on mine. This is saying the 30th, but I, you know, that's... That, ha that tends to happen in history sometimes. The dates get a little ba based on when it happened and when people recorded it. But it's supposed to be in memory of the victims of, of Hans Mill. You, oh, oh, oops, I'm sorry. Went the wrong way. Sorry. Where's the little pointer thingy? Is it the, this one? Uh, I think it's that green thing in the middle. Oh, right. duh. The green thing that's right in front of me? That thing? There you go. There we go. So Hans Mill, this was known as the Hans Mill Massacre. And now Joseph Smith said, okay, God has willed it again. We've got to move again. <laughs> so now this time we're going to move ourselves off to Nauvoo. Talk, no. uh, talk about religious freedom, right? Right, like exactly. And what's interesting is, I'm glad you said that, because religious freedom, you know, Joseph was not, even though we're, t we're in this area of the early republic where, you know, democracy is flourishing all over the place, but not so much in the Mormon faith, because he totally was, like, if this was a theocracy, right? This is God's will. God's telling you to do this. I am the, the carrier of God's will. So if you don't follow along with me, eh, you're going to hell. Good luck. So um, they find themselves now living in Nauvoo. Now, this is a modern-day picture of the city. Um, I'll talk at the end about how the Mormons have kind of been putting in some money to rebuild it. But the, the, the city was originally called Commerce, and he renamed it Nauvoo, and he said that that meant in Hebrew to be a uh, city beautiful, which I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what he said. Um, and the Mormons lived there basically for that, for that period that we talked about, 38 to, to 46. Now, once again, um, they find them, he finds himself, well, before the trouble, he does quite well, and I'm sorry, can you guys see that in the back? I sometimes think, the, is it pretty clear? Can you see that what's in the circles there? Um, he acquires, you know, they're, they're a commune, right? They're, everyone's working together, and while much has been made of the fact that he, he picked up a lot of poor and disenfranchised people, there were some also rather, rather wealthy people who went along with what he, what he was doing and believed in his mission. And so they were, they were doing pretty well for themselves. Um, Nauvoo had an army a privately owned army that had basically like, like 4,000 people in the army, which was larger than the size of the American army at the time. He was commander of it. Sometime around in the 1930s, he began to start wearing military, um, a military uniform that he just self-imposed that he started wearing this military uniform. That, and so basically, um, they were, he was very, very powerful. He makes a decision in, 18, in 1844 that he's going to run for the presidency of the United States. And uh, by this time, you know, there's some grumbling, right? This group comes in, they're kind of taking over the whole town, e the whole state, even though they were given a charter by the state of Illinois. You know, other Illinoisans are not too crazy about the amount of power that, um, that, Nauvoo, uh, that Joseph Smith is acquiring in Nauvoo. So he says he's going to run for the presidency, and his main platform is that basically he wants to release prisoners from jail. He wants to release them with the idea that they could be converted and they could be redeemed. Because also in the 1840s, this is a time of reform. Um, that we'll talk about eventually, um, where you know there was like pre, uh, re rehabilitation and, and a different take on the idea of what prison should mean and what it should look like. 
Uh, but imagine today if a politician was running on the platform of, I'm going to run for president and I'm going to free all the prisoners from prison and that's my whole entire platform, like yay. So he lost, shockingly, he does not win the election. Um, but it's, it's, this is where the controversy comes in. So Joseph Smith each time claims that he has these revelations and he now claims that God has revealed to him, but it's not revealed to all of the people of Nauvoo yet, but it's revealed to the elders that he, um, that there is now such a thing as celestial marriage or the idea of being able to have multiple partners, plural marriage, polygamy. Now, by the time that Joseph Smith dies, there are some estimates, and it's, we don't know with 100% certainty how clear this is, but that he may have had up to 50 wives. Now, why you'd want 50 wives, I have no idea. That's like, that's a great expense. <laughs> so imagine all the kids, just all the, all the hassle. Just sounds like too much, too much trouble to me. Um, but he, he had these multiple wives, but only certain people were allowed to have multiple wives, not everyone. So it was not democratic in that aspect, at least for the men. He also talked about baptism after death, the idea that you could be uh, basically your family members, if they were not a Mormon when they died, they could be baptized after they died and then become Mormon then. Um, so then they, that way you can, they can join you in the afterlife and not burn in everlasting hellfire. So it's kind of a nice thing. All right, so this is a, kind of a, a drawing or a rendering of Nauvoo as it looked uh, at the height of their power. And that's actually the temple over there. I think I've got another picture of the temple. Yeah, it's an, I, I used my, it's trying to be all like designy and kind of, and, and instead it just looks like muffled. But that's a picture of the Mormon temple or a drawing or a rendering of it um, at, the, at the time in the 1840s. So here's where, and I'm not, are you keeping track of time? I'm not really, I'm sorry. How am I doing this? Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. So here's where uh, he, he finds himself getting in trouble, Joseph Smith. Um, it's, word starts to leak out that there is this plural marriage going on and that not everyone can be a part of it. And so a, a group of people, some of whom are, are actually happens to be the cousin of Joseph Smith's first wife, who is not altogether too happy about the idea of him having multiple wives, shockingly, um, writes a, a, an article. It's, it's the first and only publication of this newspaper called the Nauvoo Expositor. And the expositor reveals, basically, that Joseph Smith and, and others um, have, have a, a lot of money, uh, or and that have uh, maybe misusing funds that are coming into the Mormon faith, and have a lot, of, a lot of wives, too. One word of this gets out, Joseph Smith, in a fit of rage, destroys this printing press. Now, we, we kind of, that whole idea of the First Amendment and that freedom of the press thing is kind of a big deal in this country. We tend to hold that to be pretty sacred. So the idea that somebody would, would, would destroy a printing press is, is not the best thing. Um, that actually also happens in, in Alton, Illinois, with, to a guy named Elijah Lovejoy, who was an abolitionist. So uh, Joseph Smith ends up getting arrested. And the governor of Illinois tells him, because there's talk about him actually leaving and not standing for the arrest and kind of taking off. The governor of Illinois persuades him to stay. And he ends up in a jail in Carthage, Illinois, which is kind of right near Nauvoo. And while he's in jail, basically, a, a group of men break into the jail. He's with his brother and one other friend. Um, and basically break themselves into the cell and, starts, and start shooting. Um, now, he's armed. He and his brother and the friend are, are heavily armed, and they're, they're shooting back. But, you know, when you have, like, 25 people versus three, it's not going to get you too far. So he's shot and basically falls out of the window, calling to God to save him as he's falling down to the ground. God didn't hear him, I guess, so because he ended up dying. Um, and just to make sure that he was dead, they end up shooting him multiple more times while he's on the ground to make sure that he is, in fact, indeed dead. So um, right after this, the legislature, the state legislature of Illinois ends up saying to, once again, to the Mormons, you're, you're out. Get out. And they revoke the charter they had issu issued them. So the story, and, and kind of like Troy will talk about with Bishop Hill, the story could have ended there. Um, you know, it very easily could have stopped in Nauvoo and not gone further. But what Joseph Smith had done was cultivate leadership to come after him. So his lieutenant was a guy by the name of Brigham Young. If you've ever, ever heard of Brigham Young University, it's named for him for a reason. And Brigham Young leads the Mormons out of Illinois now onto uh, a new path to um, Utah. What you're seeing here now is the rebuild of the temple that was uh, the original temple in the 1840s uh, and as it looks today. It's beautiful. I mean, you see it from far away. It's, it's beautifully lit and you can, it's, Nauvoo has been actually restored as of the late 90s, early 2000s by money coming in from the Church of Latter-day Saints, another name for the Mormon faith. Um, and, they're, and they're putting a lot of money back into the town to make it look like it did back then. That's why that picture I was showing you, uh, let's say this one, is actually because they rebuilt the town to look like it did. 
So they, they've been pouring massive funds into it. And what's interesting, one of the, I found an article, and I, I have yet to follow up, I probably should, um, that in the early 2000s, I think around 2003, um, the Mormon population had regrown there so much that they wanted to make uh, Nauvoo a dry town. So the, the people, in, the, in, in other words, no alcohol. So people in the neighboring towns who own bars are like, cha-ching, yes, this is great. That means that people from Nauvoo are going to come to us. Um, but people who own bars in Nauvoo are not going to be so happy with the idea of the, those bars closing. So once they leave, um, basically that, that story kind of remains, it's not buried, but it's not one of those maybe talked about portions of, of, of um, Mormon history because there's so much that happens afterwards once they get to Utah. So with that, I'm gonna, I'll stop there and turn it over to Troy and then we'll kind of we'll pick it back up afterwards. Cool. And as I do this, I also think it's interesting, um, I grew up in Illinois, you know, we don't talk about that no. time of our history either because it doesn't necessarily make us as Illinoisians look <laughs> that great chasing out a religion no. that we disagree with. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, so let me tell you about uh, Bishop Hill, Illinois. It was a colony uh, founded in 1846 and it dissolved in 1860. There's still a town of Bishop Hill. Um, I'll show you where that is in a, in a second. It's a historic site you can go visit. Um, just kind of the quick big picture overview, why do we care about Bishop Hill, Illinois? It was a foothold, um, especially for Swedish American immigration um, in the 1840s, and connecting from Western Illinois up even into Minnesota, across into Nebraska. There was a time period in Sweden where it was mostly an agrarian um, society, so people lived by growing crops, right? But it was a very rocky, mountainous country, and so at the same time as people were starting to live longer, the land wasn't getting bigger, so they had all these people around, and there was a major uh, migration of Swedes, Norwegians, um, to uh, Illinois and across the United States. So um, one of the, the biggest things they did is when they came here and established their colony, they sent letters uh, back to Sweden talking about how great it was. So if you imagine, I don't know how many of you travel in western Illinois, but we grow up kind of used to the flat rolling hills. It's like naturally irrigated. It's land that was carved from glaciers. It's some of the richest farmland in the world. You take a seed, you throw it out there, the thing grows. That's not how most of the world tends to work with agri agriculture, right? There's a lot of work. You've got to irrigate. You've got to move water. Northern Illinois, it's super easy. So they came here, and they're like, this stuff grows itself. This is fantastic. And they said, right, so they sent, they sent a letters home, and many people came over. So especially if you're in, like, the Moline, Rock Island, uh, you know, area, there's tons of folks that are still s with uh, Swedish last names. My last name is Troy Swanson. That's where I grew up. So Swanson is a Swedish last name. So that's where my interest in this um, kind of comes from, even though my family was not from Bishop Hill. Um, at the same time in Western Illinois, I, th I think it's worth mentioning that in the 1830s, the Black Hawk War had happened, right? So the United States government had decided that all these Native Americans living on this land, eh, they don't need to be here anymore. We're going to sweep them out. And uh, Chief Black Hawk led a revolt against that. So he was um, a Sauk leader lived in uh, a village on the Mississippi River where Rock Island is today, and they had settlements and um, paths across northern Illinois. Um, it's, it was a, a big, um, you know, uh, culture that was just pushed out of northern Illinois. So when the Mormons show up, when Bishop Hill shows up, everyone's like, oh, look at this virgin prairie that no one has ever lived on. It's like, no, we just kicked all those people out, and now there's this land that speculators bought that was great farmland in what's today Henry County in western Illinois. Um, and people ended up not wanting to move there. So this land that was held, and so there was this open area that's where Bishop Hill decided, the Swedes decided to settle. Um, but it, so they brought in um, tons of people, uh, f established farming, caused this migration to this area, and really sparked a mass immigration to that side of our state. Um, so that's where it is. It's really not, we always say it's southern Illinois, it's not. It's really like two hours dead west. It's right, um, I don't know, 10, 50, uh, probably 20 miles south of Interstate 80, 30 miles from the Mississippi River. So if you just keep driving that way, <laughs> you'll get pretty close to it. Um, it's, it's actually very cute right now these days, if the nice restaurants, um, historic sites, museums. So if that's your kind of thing, want to go for a little drive across uh, the open land, uh, it's, it's worth going out there. So I, don't, I get in trouble for my mom for not stopping by home if I um, go out there. So she's probably going to watch this video on YouTube later, so I'll get in trouble. Um, <laughs> So just before the Swedes migrated to Illinois, um, the Swedish Lutheran Church was a arm of the government, essentially. So to be basically counted as a citizen, you had to be baptized, you had to communion, you had to go to, 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 go to church. 
there were these movements um, across Europe that were breaking away from the strict religious views. And, they, the, it, there's, a, and there's a number of these. Um, and the basic premise was, I do not need a minister to have a relationship with God. I can communicate directly with God. And, I, it's, and it was even to the point where like, you couldn't have a religious service in your home um, without having a, a, a Lutheran pastor um, present. Um, and, and I'm really not a historian of that, so I want to be careful. Like, there's all kinds of things you can read and learn more, so don't just take my word for it. Please, please research. Um, so there was a guy named Eric Jansen who decided that uh, God had spoken to him. He had fallen down in a field, a, kind of a very similar story, had a revelation that he was a new prophet from God, and that we did not have to wait until um, we died to receive the benefits of heaven, but that we could have the benefits of heaven now um, if only we believed. And so he started preaching this, and it was really compelling to a lot of people that, um, actually across different classes, but especially folks that didn't have a lot of hope um, in a lot of uh, different areas. So they, they broke away um, from the, the Lutheran Church. And as you might imagine, the Lutheran Church officials didn't like that very much. And in fact, um, there was a lot of controversy. Families were broken up. Uh, the, the Eric Jansen's followers burnt um, books in different cities. Um, they burnt Luther's Catechism, which is the founding document for Lutheranism, and so they, um, you know, Lutherans didn't really like that very much. So, uh, so it eventually things got kind of bad, and they decided, hey, you know what, we can get out of Sweden and find a new place to go that's going to be our new um, Jerusalem. So they decided to uh, migrate, em emigrate to the United States. If I have next, yeah, okay. So they um, they actually because there were so many people that couldn't afford to make the trip. They put all their money together and lived as a communistic kind of society. So not Karl Marx um, communism, but more they wanted to model themselves after um, the, the early Christians um, after uh, Jesus' death, where they lived in common. They, no one owned anything, but everything, everyone owned everything, right? Yeah, it was shared. So they took a boat to um, New York. One, an interesting story. They thought when they arrived in New York City that if they believed enough, if they prayed hard enough, they would learn English through the Holy Spirit. Uh, didn't work so well, they, so they prayed harder. But that was like a key thing for them. If only you believed, you could overcome the challenges of our world, and um, that didn't always work itself out. So they, they took uh, boats across the Great Lakes, ended up in Chicago, and then came when it was like two or 300 people um, across northern Illinois, so there's not Interstate 80 at the time, right? Um, they put all their stuff in carts. Those who could walked, those who couldn't rode. So they walked. 148 miles across. So they left in the spring when you could cross the Atlantic, got to New York, got to Chicagoland in the summer. They show up in the fall. So if you don't know much about farming, fall in Illinois is not a good time to plant crops. Things don't grow, especially once November and December hit, right? So that first winter was really rough, really bad. They, they came. They didn't have homes. They, they lived in um, dugouts, in dirt dugouts on the side of a hill. And in the mornings, they would be pulling the bodies out of, of people who died, who didn't make it through the night. So it was really a bad winter, eating horses, eating anything they could get. And that's a very common kind of story um, in the 1800s of folks coming to the United States because you have to make that trip through the winter, and they show up without much money, without much food. So once that spring came, so this was in 1846, um, probably spring of 1847, then things started to, to grow. So you had all these people that were um, knowledgeable, knowledgeable about farming, making this huge colony following Eric Jansen. And so um, they, they ended up making a huge town. This is a, a picture, uh, huge for the time, called a, a, a building called Big Brick, where everybody lived. It's basically like a big apartment building. And for that time, this was like super innovative. Like the, this was the largest living structure, um, probably, I don't know, outside of Chicago um, in that area. Like you would, they, I don't know how many families. It actually burnt down in the, in the middle of the 20th century. And that sparked a, a, a call to preserve the buildings that were still there. So it's, it lasted for quite a while. Um, but everyone, the, the men went out in the fields and worked. And they had this huge workforce. Um, they had a mill. So then other farmers started coming in, bringing their crops in to get their crops milled. And they became like an economic center for that area. Um, of course, you'll see a pattern forming here. Um, Eric Jansen actually had a conflict with another Swede who moved into that town with him. He wasn't an original believer, but came to live with them. Um, and he was murdered in my hometown, Cambridge, Illinois, at the courthouse, um, shot outside on the steps of the courthouse. So now they had this moment of panic, right? Their prophet had died. Oh, and by the way, um, they didn't bury him for three days. They let him sit on the altar for three days. So for those of you that know your um, Christian uh, history, 
um, Jesus rose after three days. It's quite embarrassing to bury your prophet, and then three days later, he's knocking on the <laughs> c casket trying to get out. So I just wanted to be sure we're not going to stick this guy in the ground until we know he's not coming back, and, and he didn't come back, and they buried him. But then what happened is that um, there were, like, elders that were basically elected that took over that ran um, Bishop Hill. Um, oh, I, I skipped the cholera. There's a big cholera outbreak that hit that area, um, and Eric Jansen literally said, if you believe, you can overcome cholera. And people, they, didn't, they wanted to be believers. They wanted to show that they had faith and they didn't want to let their prophet down. So they wake up in the morning, I don't feel so great, just believe. And they'd be out working in the fields, like keeling over, like dying. And so it was, it was pretty gruesome and pretty rough. It, and it's a, you know, living in the, uh, opening up the prairie like that anyway, was, it was a rough lifestyle to start with compared to, you know, there's no Netflix, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> after, after Jansen's death, it, the Bishop Hill really blossomed. And there was this flow of people that kept coming in over the years. Some people would come and stay. They had um, uh, a fishing village on the Mississippi River near Rock Island today. They had a second farm near Orion, Illinois, which is not too far away. There's a, a historical marker out there. Um, they sold broom corn, which is a corn that, which is a, it's actually a type of grass that they used to make brooms um, in St. Louis. And they traded in New York. And they, they had they had um, investments all across um, Western Illinois and Northern Illinois. They brought the railroad into a little town called Galva, Illinois, which is there today. So it became this like thriving economic kind of metropolis, right? Unfortunately, they got a little carried away with their investments, and there was a there was a, a economic crash, a stock crash, um, thanks to the Crimean War in Europe um, in the late 1840s, or 1850s, late 1850s, and they really basically went bankrupt, and everything. Um, fell apart and they couldn't um, pay their bills and then they really became insoluble and so they basically split split up and oh this is the a steeple building still there this is a museum today um, people lived in that as uh, apartment buildings um, so each family owned an area it was kind of like a condo um, again up until like the 1860 or uh, 1960s there were families that grew up in there that were original descendants of of the Bishop Hill colony through there um, in the early 20th century, um, uh, linguists came and studied the Swedish that was spoken in Bishop Hill because it still preserved language that um, had died out in Sweden itself. And in um, 1996, on the 200th anniversary or 150th anniversary of um, the big Swedish immigration, um, the king and queen in Sweden actually went to Bishop Hill as one of the key historic markers to recognize the role that it played in the connections between um, our country and Sweden. So. Um, it's still remembered in some circles, for sure. Um, the thing that's interesting is that after the collapse in around 1860, um, everyone decided um, we're going to split this thing up. We're going to take our share. Everyone got so much money. Whatever was left, they sold things off, sold off buildings, lands, and you got a portion of it if you were still a colonist. And in 1860, they actually sent a regiment, Bishop Hill Regiment, to um, the Civil War to fight for the North. And this is a monument that's in the park in Bishop Hill today that honors um, the soldiers that went and fought um, in that war. So I think it's an interesting kind of um, progression, I watch my time, um, where at different conflicts they band together. So in Sweden they had a conflict and they banded together and they went to um, Illinois. They came to Illinois and they fought through this winter. They, had a, they lost their profit and they banded together and we're going to hang in there and we're going to stay together. But by the time the economics, e economic collapse happened, they had a different kind of outcome where they decided, hey, we don't need to band together anymore. We're going to stay here, and we're going we're gonna to flourish, and we're, we're not going to be a colony. And they, they decided to dissolve. So they didn't do what the Mormons did, where they packed up and said, hey, we're going to head further west, which they, could, they surely could have done. Um, in fact, they, were so, they felt so ingrained in where they were that they sent men to go fight in a war that they wouldn't have even fought in. They'd only been, you know, been there for, what, you know, 14 years. So um, I think it's interesting, and, and it's hard to document why. We don't know why they did what they did, and we don't know why they didn't band together. But it seems like there's a lot of records that show um, many, many interactions with the community around, and that they had built a community. And um, um, Augustana Lutheran Church is a little Lutheran church that's in um, Andover, Illinois. And you may have heard of Augustana College. Like that was, it's the lar a large, it became a large Lutheran Swedish denomination in that part of Illinois. And it, a lot of it came from people who came with the Bishop Hill Colony and decided, I don't want to hang out with these. Eric Jansen's kind of crazy. Thanks for the, lo the ride. I'm going to go back and be a Lutheran again. And so there was this, this big um, connection, that whole side of Illinois. Um, Bishop Hill had a huge connection through Galesburg and Knox College um, uh, settling that. And so I'm, I think it's an interesting story of, of assimilation, Americanization, 
and um, building up community, and, and it's, it's hard to, to get all that set, um, but it's, it's a, a pattern that gets broken for sure, and it's a good contrast with uh, Nauvoo. Yeah, thank, thank you. So we still have some time. You want to talk? Yeah. Uh, what, like any? Yeah. Should we do questions then? Yeah. yeah. Anybody else have any questions? <laughs> yeah, please. Here. Here, wait. Let me give you wait. Oh, I can get it. Hi, my name is Kip Kozad. I work at the college. Some of you may know me. A um, couple points. And the reason that I came here is I, I have this kind of weird connection with Mormons. And it's n I'm not a Mormon myself, but um, my grandfather was, or my great great grandfather was from Nauvoo. And he was a wagon maker. And he wa made a lot of the wagons that the Mormons took when they, when they went out. Yeah, they hired him to do that. So that's one connection. The second connection is I'm from Western Missouri, I'm from a town called Liberty. And Liberty is in Clay County. And in the Mormon tradition, Clay County is considered the Garden of Eden. So there's lots and lots of Mormons in and around there. And there's a jail in my town. My town's Liberty is known for two things. The Mormon jail, where, where uh, Joseph Smith was held before he escaped to, to go to, to Nauvoo. And it's also the first daylight bank robbery committed in the United States by none other than Jesse James. So <laughs> that's the other one. So, But my question is, um, you know, being Illinois history and all of that, was there, was there any connection, did, was there any, did, for example, um, Abraham Lincoln, did he cut cross paths with any of these narratives that we have here? Um, the Mormons also, because, um, you know, uh, John Smith, or um, John, uh, John Brown, being from Ohio, and then going out to Kansas, was, and he kind of fitting in kind of with this, this kind of movement that existed. Did you come across anything related to the connection with that? I didn't come across anything about Lincoln's connection necessarily with, with Nauvoo. Um, it was more of a local connection. It's believed that he was traveling down this way, down the i &M Canal, on his way down to Springfield. But I did not come across anything suggesting that he had a, ever had ties with Joseph Smith because he was in the legislature. He would have been, a, I think he would have been a Whig in the, in the state legisla legislature at the time. Um, but I don't, I don't, I did not come, come across anything that would. It's a good question. It's, an, it's, it's a good, it's a fair point. I'd really actually like to know now myself <laughs> whether it's true. Anything about Bishop Hill and any of these? No, I mean nothing that I know. I mean I know there's a, a Lincoln Douglas debate site I believe in Kewanee, Illinois, which is right by Bishop Hill. Um, Lincoln um, was involved in a lawsuit for the first bridge that crossed the Mississippi River. Um, he's famous for that, and of, and of course he served in the army during the Black Hawk War. So he's clearly in that area, not far um, from Nauvoo or or Bishop Hill. But yeah, nothing else. Yeah, well, I, I'll give us a little push. But I think an interesting thing that I always think about with, with Bishop Hill and the, the immigration history is it's still, there's still so many stories, like immigration is such a hot topic right now, right? And the kinds of stories that we hear today still to me um, sound so true um, even from the 1840s, right? Like the, in some ways, uh, obviously there's differences and, and I don't want to downplay um, that, that history changes and circumstances change. But also this the idea of coming here and and adding to America, not just becoming American and becoming assimilated, but changing what America is. And there's no doubt that something like Bishop Hill greatly altered what Western Illinois was. And there was, there was Swedish um, Methodists fighting with Swedish Lutherans, fighting with old Eric Jantinus that became Adventists, right? And all still in Swedish, out there yelling at each other, right? And, and we don't talk about that very much because it's, sometimes it's not very pleasant. Sometimes people um, were not very nice. Um, but but also there's still these stories of, of struggle and understanding each other and re recognizing what America could become. And I, I still think those stories play out today. And I think that studying this kind of history um, teaches us that when we look back and look at now, when we look at then through our, our lens now, which um, is still relevant. Yeah, um, while we're on the, on the same, uh, same subject, you said something I wanted to pick up on, um, immigration. Oh yeah. So we were just talking about this, uh, uh, sorry, I, you know, I, I'm Dory from Finding Nemo, so I lose my train of thought sometimes. So we were just talking about this on, on Monday, actually, about immigration. We were talking about, the, we're going backwards with American history with this class. So we were covering the 1850s, and we were talking about the Know Nothing Party and this idea of this anti-immigration wave. And I think that kind of also fits, even though the Mormons were not necessarily immigrants from another country, 
they were of, uh, they were of a different faith, right? And we were talking about that. How you know how does America react when something of a different faith kind of comes along? Um, and it, I didn't get into some of the other stuff about about Mormonism, but Joseph Smith, you know, claimed that this was these were one of the lost tribes of Israel. Um, and that they were, they were seeking a new Jerusalem, you know, I, I, everywhere he went. He's like, okay, it's not in Ohio, but it's in Missouri now. <laughs> and then it's not in Missouri. Well, maybe it's in Illinois. Um, so this narrative of this idea of, of them being unwelcome and almost like a pariah because they were different and because they were powerful. You know, it's easy to like to like someone, but if they're powerful too, then they become a little bit more dangerous. Um, so it, it definitely, even though why they were, while they were not immigrants, um, that their differences definitely made them suspect. Um, and I don't think Joseph Smith helped it too much with some of the things that he did, like the idea of, you know, I'm going to run for president and have an army that's bigger than that of the United States of America and, you know, all that stuff. But everywhere they went, they were kind of pushed out violently. I didn't mention that in um, when leaving Ohio, um, he was tarred and feathered at one point. And we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to the revolution more. But it's literally pouring hot tar on someone, which could have killed somebody, depending on the circumstance, and then putting feathers on them to kind of resemble that of a, of a chicken. Um, but this was, uh, it was, there was definitely violence. They, they were provoking violence, no doubt. Yeah, that's also, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, there's a question. Yeah. Sorry, Kip, I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay, so okay. my question is, um, did the Mormon faith faith ever leave America, or like if it didn't, then what might have affected that? That's a really good question. So I'm not an expert on Mormonism, but I will tell you that they are awesome at sending people out. That's a, as a matter of fact, it's part of being a Mormon. And I forgot what the, the term is for it is, but you take a, basically a year is a two years where you're basically supposed to go out and process missions. Yeah, duh, I should have. You're expected, you're expected to be out and proselytize to try to convert people. And, and so they, they travel all over the world. And Mormons, it's, it's so interesting how powerful they've become in such a short time, right? You know, this, this faith starts in the 1820s, and you had a guy who was running for president in 2012 as it would have been the first Mormon president, Mitt Romney. Um, and there, there a lot of members of Congress, big members of Congress, are Mormons. So, yeah, their influence does extend. It may not be to the extent of some other Protestant faiths, but it definitely... Is is worldwide. That's their mission is to tr is to convert people worldwide. So very good question. Um, I was just going to maybe you guys could share the connection in the 1840s, 1850s of the Second Great Awakening, Awakening. Yeah. along with utopianism, mm -hmm. which is kind of a connection mm -hmm. between the two. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, no, you're no, you're good. You keep going. You're totally fine. No, you're good. Yeah, they, so, and we haven't we haven't gotten to this yet. Oh, is there another is there a question back there? Oh, I can eat the question first if you want, and then go back to what or, or while he's. So um, the idea of a, you know this utopian community, right? Bishop Hill was kind of this idea of this this perfect commune essentially, and so people were seeking out this. Th it, and when we talk about the Second Great Awakening, we'll talk about kind of what what started this religious revival, but. Definitely Mormonism is part of that, because that was beginning even like in the 1820s. It was this, kind of this religious fervor, and that kind of, I think, is allows um, Joseph Smith to accumulate so many people to follow him, because he promised this idea of such a, this, this perfect world. If you only obeyed God's commandment, this perfect world will exist. So, yeah, good question. Thank you. And I think also, just real quick, the idea of utopianism in Illinois, in not just in Illinois, yeah. but across the United States is a big um, theme. So like the Amana colonies in Iowa is another mm -hmm. example where we have this quote unquote open unused land, which yeah. is never true, um, where we're gonna find our new Jerusalem. And there's a whole string of, of communities like that as the, the, the frontier, yes, as the frontier moved west, you can find people going just across the frontier to build their new religious homes. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, hi. hi. So um, regarding the Mormons, uh, when they, they originated in uh, New York, correct? Mm -hmm. Palmyra, yeah. All right, so uh, did their ideals because of the, uh, was it, Great Awakening mm -hmm. movement? Um, is that what really clashed with like the, the people of New York? Uh. Is why they left New York in the first place? Is because those ideals, those uh, were being, uh, you know, reintegrated into society mm -hmm. at the time with uh, regarding Christianity and religion? Those are, that's a great question as well. Um, and, and it's not really their religious beliefs. I mean, the polygamy in Illinois turned off a lot of people. There's no doubt about it. It just kind of confirmed their worst fears that they had about this Mormon faith. Um, but a lot of it had usually had to do with like business. 
you know, they, they made a lot of enemies because they, they, did, they did do, usually did do pretty well um, commercially. They traded, um, but now in the case of Ohio, it, he invested some money, some of the Mormon money and some not so good ventures and they ended up having to declare bankruptcy and had a lot of creditors on their tail and that's when he had to kind of leave town. So I think that, that the religious values, and again, the differences I'm sure exacerbated other problems, but it usually tended to be this fear of how powerful this community was going to become. Because everywhere they went, they were they made a splash you know, quickly, so um, so I would argue that had more more to do with it than anything else. But the the religious values also did play a role, no doubt, or became an excuse. Sometimes. Yeah, right. I mean the and I don't. This is again. I'm, this is not my area either. You may know better than me, Mary. But you know the charter that they got from the state of Illinois gave a lot of autonomy to Joseph Smith. Like mm -hmm. they almost like carved out their own mini state. Yeah within Illinois, and so like our municipal government now, so if you live in Palos Hills or, or whichever community, the, that exists because the state of Illinois gives them the ability to make a municipality. Right. So you can't just take your neighborhood and say, hey, this is now Troy's town, I'm gonna charge my own taxes and break away from Palos Hills. <laughs> Palos Hills has its own borders, and, and it goes. Right. They essentially did that for the Mormons in some ways, for, for Joseph Smith. Absolutely. Like, hey, have your own little mini state, don't worry about us, and they kind of recognized afterwards, like, whoa, this guy, is building up it, um, some real wealth and power, and we should keep an eye on this. And, and so sometimes the religion becomes the excuse connected with that. No, absolutely. So in Illinois, if you're putting it in the greater context, um, at the time, Illinois needed settlers. They needed money. Um, they needed capital. Um, this is the time that we're building the Illinois-Michigan Canal. And it was also in the time of, of, a, of a panic and a depression. They're kind of coming out of, by the time the Mormons leave, they're coming out of this, this um, panic and depression of 1837. Um, but yeah, they, they, they wanted to give them a charter to bring them in. But then when they saw just how powerful, again, that army, that army being so powerful, him becoming so, such an, just an autocrat basically, um, definitely left some Illinoisans feeling very uneasy about it. Um, but it's interesting how, and I, I wanna look more into the idea of, of why the, the, the story of the governor persuading him to stay, because Joseph Smith kinda had, had, had this feeling, because he gets on a horse, the story is, he gets on a horse and he's like, okay, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm heading for Wisconsin, see ya. And that something basically compels him to turn around and to come back to, to, um, to Carthage. Um, and I don't know what the governor's request is in conjunction with that, but um, you know, he ends up making a decision to stay. And that decision, it's interesting, we've talked about in history about how people make decisions. And history doesn't just occur in a vacuum, it occurs when people make a deci decision one way or the other. So his deciding, Joseph Smith deciding to stay and face that and then also then be killed makes him a martyr, right? He's now the, the, our leader who, who's been cut down in his prime. Um, and so it gives the Mormons now a new narrative of, of kind of, that you know, allows them to go on. Whereas, you know, they could have just, it could have, again, could have ended right then and there. Um, so how much of that then ends up leading to the Mormons, you know, going out to, they were gonna go to Utah at the time, once after Joseph Smith got killed, they're like, okay, we gotta get out of here. We're not, we're not that welcome here. And then Illinois revoked their charter and they were, they were on their way out leaving. But um, it is interesting how much his death then changed the, the, tra the trajectory of Mormonism altogether. And it also impacted Illinois. You know, in, in my research on Bishop Hill, there were articles um, in Rock Island newspapers from the early 1850s that said, hey, these um, Bishop Hill Swedes, they're not Mormons. Mm -hmm. They have their religious views, but they're not like Mormons. So they, they remembered, mm -hmm. you know, even that, mm -hmm. that um, like a decade later, yeah. and made the point that these are not the same kind of people, that however valid that is or not, but yeah. um, it, it came up. Yep. Other questions or comments? Did you want to say or? Oh, just look if anyone has a question. All right, so there's one up, one up here. Hi, um, would you uh, say that the uh, Mormons religion took on like an extreme, uh, uh, what's it called, an extreme path mm -hmm. for um, uh, like how badly they wanted to uh, grow their empire? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the idea of like the a hard line ideology with like with regards to like the polygamy or just the idea or do you mean something else? Like I mean like um, how far did they like take it to like have people um, side with them basically? Oh okay. 
So that's a, another good question. So Joseph Smith oftentimes would say that, you know, this is the will of God, basically. So I've got a, I've had a quote here. Um, oh, I think I just lost it, but I had a quote where, yeah, um, where he's basically saying that, you know, it's time. God has said now this is the moment where now we need to leave. And, and coincidentally, it, it had something to do with the idea that they were being forced out at the same time. So yeah, usually, and, and having that, that persecution narrative going, like, you know, we're, th we're this persecuted people, tends to draw people together um, and make them closer. Um, so that that definitely did not, was, was to his advantage. And people regarded that whatever, he, because then as time goes on, only, it's only the revelations from God, from the angel through Joseph, that's it. That's the, there's no more buried plates anywhere. This is, this, he, is, he is the conduit between, you know, between the Mormons and God. So it's, it's, it's kind of his way or the highway, basically. So yeah, that, that definitely was, it was because he, he, you could argue he manipulated people by saying God was willing it to happen that way to get what he wanted. And also, um, did like economics play a part in this? Mm, definitely, because they were, again, as I mentioned, some of the people that were coming along with him were poor, but a lot of them were actually like the guy that sold his house, sold his farm to help him pay for the, for the Book of Mormon publication. You know, he wasn't necessarily a poor man. He didn't have the collateral to just pay for it outright. But um, so he had a lot of people that, and I, one of the articles I, I was reading from years ago kind of dispels that myth. It was just kind of poor people. So he, so th they were financially successful um, and they were hardworking and they were communal the way the people at Bishop Hill were. So if you're working all together, and again, with this idea that's us versus them, you know, everyone doesn't like us, so we got to band together, it tends to, to help you. And again, while some of the decisions economically were not that great, um, in places like Nauvoo, they were, they were doing very, very well. So it, you could maybe argue that it was his own um, hubris or his own, you know, um, well, that, yeah, hubris that basically led him to the idea that, that now his, he, could, he has the right to take 50 wives and have children with all of them. And again, that just, the thought of that just gives me a headache. But <laughs> thank, okay, you. thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Are we, what time are we at here? Oh, we're like at 150. Yeah, Anything else okay. you want to? I'll just do just a quick commercial. We will have uh, several um, uh, Illinois bicentenni Bicentennial events left this fall. One in particular, and I didn't bring the dates, of course. Um, it's on the library website, but it'll be super fun. It's going to be a panel discussion with Mary and I and our colleagues, Jim McIntyre and Josh Fulton from History. And we are going to cover m over 200 years of <laughs> Illinois history in an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. So it's going to be awesome. We're going from the glaciers. Maybe not, <laughs> yeah, maybe, not, maybe, maybe not that far. Maybe not that far, but pretty far. Joliet to uh, mm -hmm. Obama. That is two. Isn't it Tuesday, October 9th, I believe, is the date that I have written down here. So that's yeah. That's when. I'll, I'll let you guys know if anybody would want to come. Um, we'll make an extra credit opportunity involved in that. So. Um, okay. okay. Great. Any other any other questions or comments? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.